on Daytime Buffalo, a bakery with a mission. Why this new establishment says they are all about giving back to the community. And finding a minority-owned business has never been easier. That brown bag joins us in the studio to talk about their on-stop shop approach. It's all coming up right here on Daytime Buffalo. Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to Daytime Buffalo. I'm your host, Chelsea Lavelle. Well, today is the last day of Black History Month. It's important to celebrate victories and achievements in the community every day, and that doesn't stop with just today. Right now, I'm joined by Chantel Patton, the founder of That Brown Paper Bag Minority Business Directory. Chantel, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I want you to talk to me a little bit about that brown bag. We have the book in the directory right here, but for those who aren't quite sure what it is, can you explain? Absolutely. So that brown bag is, in fact, a minority business directory. It was um, created in 2018, and I designed it to serve as a one-stop shop, a comprehensive resource for individuals who are looking to support the Buy Black movement to really have an answer to the I didn't know who or where. Um, it started out uh, as a little pamphlet, and as you can see today, it's grown and I'm hoping that it continues in its growth pattern. How long have you been around and doing this? Uh, five plus years. Um, I'm always, of course, been a supporter of black owned business. I've been black all my life. So, <laughs> um, but this really turned into a movement for me in 2018. In 2018. Um, talk to me a little bit about what the what it was like trying to get this together. You had to go out in the community, I'm sure, go around. How did you kind of build this, your Rolodex, to be able to make this? So. Um, the, the crazy part is, is actually this started from a Facebook post. No way. Um, I was actually scrolling along Facebook and I came across a post that says, why doesn't somebody create a list of all the black owned businesses in Buffalo? But when I read it, the universe actually reworded it and said, Chantel, why don't you create a black owned business directory of the list of all the black owned businesses in Buffalo? My next Facebook post was tag all the black owned businesses that you know of here. And that was what started the directory. That was what started the movement that we all now know as that brown bag. And you guys have a website in just the book. And this is really cool because you can say, like you said, I, I want a black chiropractor. It's here, right? You know where to go. What more do you want? Where do you want to see this go? Um, I think that this is uh, something that can be utilized from city to city, state to state. We're talking about um, an opportunity to give a highlight to the backbone of communities in every city, everywhere. Um, small black owned businesses actually create and drive the landscape in the community I know in which I live. I'm sure where you're from as well. Um, so we're talking about supporting a community that supports us. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have the directory um, that is our annual publication. We have the Brown Bag Certified website. We've got Instagram and Facebook. Everything is that Brown Bag. And then I also have the Brown Bag Business Association where I support the business owners that are listed in the publication with tips, information, resources, things of that nature as well. You're helping them to continue to succeed. What do you think is next for you and the brown bag? Uh, for us, I think we are looking to try to move this to a mobile application um, versus someone carrying around the book, which I love um, the feel of turning pages. Mm -hmm. But I would like this to be the most accessible resource around where someone can simply pull out their phones. We have them in our pockets and in our hands all the time. So why not have this resource at people's fingertips um, even more accessible than it is today? How can people contact you if they want to be added and, and what more do you do to help the businesses that you support in this book? Everything um, is Brown Bag Certified, www.brownbagcertified.com for being able to be listed into the directory. And um, I mean, I'm looking just to, to provide exposure. So I receive requests for um, proposals. I rec receive vendor requests from corporations and organizations. And my job is to put these businesses in front of those entities. I can't think of a better person to ask. What do you think Black History Month means to you? Well, my Black History Month starts on January 1st and <laughs> ends on December 31st. Mm -hmm. But Black History Month is an opportunity for us to really hone in and, and self-reflect on our history. Um, those of us that are still here are the strongest of the strongest. Um, and to have a moment to take that in, reflect on it, um, and really sit with it. Absolutely. What are you hoping um, for the next people that come around and get added? How are they going to have continued success and how are you going to help them? Um, I think it's really just in the, the sharing of information and of knowledge. Um, 
a lot of the things that we are looking for and to do require access to information. And in me being the, the conduit that takes them from not knowing to knowledge, I'm hoping that it expands their base and it takes them from surviving to thriving in their business. I think you're doing an incredible job. And also, let's talk about the merch that you're wearing now, because you don't just highlight other businesses. You have your own merch. Um, yeah, so there is absolutely going to be the, uh, it's about the, the the black business owners. For me, you're going to see that logo. You'll see the the, the Africa and the fist. Um, they're all symbols of what it means to be black and what it means to really persevere. So I have merchandise, sweatshirts, T-shirts. Um, and it's more than just slapping a logo on a piece of merchandise or on a garment. It's really, these are all thought out pieces. Um, you know, definitely just tapping deep into the, the messagery that comes in our fabrics and, you know, the colors and, you know, just really being intentional about what we put forth as far as what we are representing. And really quickly, tell me about the event you're having this weekend. Um, this Saturday, uh, Princess's Studio and Art Gallery on Hurdle Avenue, I'm hosting I Love You Black Man. Um, this is going to be a mind, body, spirit experience. Um, black men are often told you can't cry. You can't be vulnerable. And that often takes them from a couch of depression to a couch of anger. This event is designed with the hopes to start the conversation that says it is okay to be vulnerable. It is okay to feel. Um, and what are your outlets when you do have those times and those moments? Well, Chantel, thank you so much for being on here. And thank you for your continued work and, and bringing up the black community and beyond. So I wish you luck. You I'm so looking much. out for that app. I hope it's coming soon. And thank you for being here. Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church has been a cornerstone in Buffalo's black faith community for centuries. I sat down with a pastor at Bethel AME to turn back the pages of its history from its founding to the Underground Railroad and beyond. <laughs> You've probably heard of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so God, we clap our hands and we praise you. We it stands on the corner of Michigan and Ferry in the city of Buffalo. But what you know of Bethel AME today came after many years of change. It began uh, in 1831, organized in 1831. Uh, and was called the Colored Methodist Society or Colored Methodist Church and then became uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church or Society of Buffalo. Uh, from there, the church moved into a unit from Carroll Street to Vine Street and became known as the Vine Street AME Church. Uh, and from there, uh, the church uh, continued to grow. The historic Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church is the oldest congregation of African descent of both the city of Buffalo and Western New York. In fact, the church has a history that predates the corporation of the Queen City. And it was organized just one year prior to the incorporation of the city of Buffalo itself. And since then has amassed uh, significant membership. It's a home for many in Buffalo's black community today a pillar of faith as strong as its history is deep. But in the 19th century, Bethel AME also served as a different kind of safe haven. Our first site on Carroll Street was uh, one of the stops for the Underground Railroad. And then our church, uh, where we moved to on Vine Street, we had a frame structure and then later erected a brick structure on Vine Street. And that was one of the major stops to the Underground Railroad because of our connections with persons moving from the South and moving into the North. And this present building is also reported as being one of the stops that was utilized during the Underground Railroad. Black people on their journey to escape slavery using the Underground Railroad would be supported and guided by members of the church as well as our neighbors in the North. The Underground Railroad comes up Michigan Street uh, where the church's former locations were, and then it turns here uh, from Michigan to East Ferry, where then the Underground Railroad uh, proceeded down to what was called uh, Black Rock, which is now uh, Broderick Park. And that was the stop where the um, African Americans would partner with uh, persons from Canada who had ferries who would ferry them across from Black Rock now known as Broderick Park, uh, to Canada. I asked you to prepare yourself to open the door, allow them to come in. That's the only way you can change. It's the only way you can affect change in your life. History is always being written, and our history is not just behind us. 
it's in front of us. The same is true for the generation's long story of Bethel AME. That's what Pastor Thomas wants us to keep in mind this Black History Month. So let this congregation's age and its growth and its different acquisitions of property and its development and its vision for the future reflect that, that Buffalo is just getting started. It's a star on the horizon. And this congregation is a star on the horizon. Coming up after the break, we dive head first into one of Buffalo's best soul food restaurants, Big Mama's Hustle and Soul. Shows me how it's done. Keep it here. The new subway line is changing the way some New Yorkers get around, and it's saving some as much as 45 minutes on their commute. Check it out. It's the first time in a century change like this has come to the Long Island Railroad, the first train rolling into Grand Central Madison around 6 this morning. In New York style, it carried commuters in a hurry but happy. Great ride. Very good. Smoothest ride on the Long Island Railroad. Yeah. All branches of the LIRR now make stops here with 274 additional trains each weekday. That's a 41% increase in services. Throughout the day, railroad riders continue to show their excitement since many now have trimmed up to 40 minutes off their commute. It's a dream come true. Finally made it. Finally made it. Two minutes to walk to, walk to work. It's lovely. It's great changed my life. The new station means for the first time Long Island commuters have direct access to Manhattan's east side. Before this, the only option was Penn Station on the west side. But for those who still need to head to the west side, it does come with headaches. The new schedule means less trains will run there and also, in some cases, longer transfer times at Jamaica Station. The only bad part is you have to wait a half hour at Jamaica to transfer. And for those commuters heading into Brooklyn, many direct trains between Long Island and Atlantic Terminal no longer exist. This man says it's like the city is favoring Manhattan commuters. It's an inconvenience. So it's either you're going to reach the work way earlier or you're going to reach the work later. So for me, I got to leave earlier. After greeting commuters today at the new station, we questioned the LIRR president about these issues, asking if this new schedule will stick. This is a lot of change for a railroad that, with respect to its schedules, hasn't changed all that much for the last hundred years. So we're going to see who's taking what trains and we're going to adjust as we go. Talk to me about what it's like owning and having this establishment, Big Mama's Hustle and Soul. You guys are pretty new. You've only been open for about two years, right? Yeah, it'll be two years in September. Actually, September 11th, it'll be two years. It's, good, it's great having a business like this. It's hard, but it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. I like it. I, I'm not going to say I like it. I love it. Good. I love it. I, I love the people. I love cooking because I have five kids, three boys, two girls, and I had to cook. Uh-huh. And I was... There was a lot of cooking in that yeah, household. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of cooking. And also, I used to cook, you know, sell dinners out of my house. Okay. And my girls would be there helping me, and, and I used to always tell them, this kitchen is getting too small, I need something bigger. And look at that, you manifested all of this. Yes, yes, I did, yes I did. And I love that you said this is really a family-run business. Yeah. Now your dad actually started this first, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of wanted to take a step back and you stepped in. Yes, he was like, you know, you got this down pat. It's not like he just walked away from it mm -hmm. because he's still involved. If there's something that I need, Firewise is going shopping or I'm not sure um, who to call for, like anything. Mm -hmm. He's still there. Mm -hmm. And he let me do my thing. Yeah. And 
I'm loving it. That's good. I'm loving Talk it. Talk to me a little bit about how the community has accepted you and welcomed you. Oh, the community loves the food. They love it. When I say Wednesdays and Thursdays are kind of slow, but our Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, the phones are ringing, the DoorDash is going off, the Grubhub, the door is ringing, the chime is going. Mm -hmm. They really love the food around here. When I told one of my customers that we might be closing down, they were like, oh no, don't do that. Why would you do that? Where are we gonna get our food from? And then when he came back in, he was like, oh, I see you're still here. And I'm like, yeah, we're still here, good. And like I said, they love it around here. Mm -hmm. They love the oxtails, the macaroni and cheese, the ribs, the, the yams, steak rolls, all of that. Uh, I love the people around here. And they're not the only ones that come to the restaurant. We have people from the east side. Even though they say it's a long, a long ride, but they still come. That's amazing. And you know what the best part about being a small owned business like you is you really get to know the people. Yes. What's it like when someone comes in, they're like, I can't, I can't come, but I really want this. It, it, you know what, it puts a smile on my face and not only on my face, but my heart. Mm -hmm. Because I know I'm doing something right. When I know people are coming in and when they come back, especially when they come back, and my regulars, and then when my regulars say, oh, I told my friend, or I told my aunt, I told my mother, they'll be in. And these people really come in. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing other people with them. And it's like, wow, Chantel, look at you. Yeah. Look at you. You are loved. Yes. And welcome. Yes. So thank you for what you're doing for the community, bringing a local business, a black owned business yes. to our community and you are thriving, you are uh, excelling and we're so proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you're feeling hungry because we're going to make you more hungry right now. <laughs> Joining me in the kitchen studio today is Lee and LaVita of Rada Big Goods. Yes. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming on. Thank hey, you. Thank you for having us. You guys are having your grand opening coming up soon. How excited are you? Very much. When is it? March 18th. March 18th. Yes. Now, I want to know a little bit about how you, your background and how you got into baking because you have a local story. Yeah. So <laughs> my husband suggested one day that we jump into this venture. Uh, he has a background history in higher education. Okay. Graduated with his master's degree and I went to culinary school for right baking here. pastry arts. ECC. Yes, North Campus. Nice. And they have really nice chefs there. Uh, we went through the program. I was actually pregnant with my youngest son at the time. <laughs> so he, in a way, was there the whole entire journey up to this point. Yeah. We uh, started off online, launched in 2020 with our LLC. We were doing it through Facebook markets and things like that. Then about maybe like six months into that, we went into the West Side Bazaar. Uh, we were there for a year and we decided last July to actually go upon the venture of getting into a brick and mortar yes. building. Um, I want to know, because you guys have a really important mission, and I think yes. it's really special, because you brought all of this deliciousness, and it's gorgeous, but you're doing more. You're giving back to the community, right? Yes. So uh, what we do here in the community, we like to partner with different corporations, uh, not-for-profit organizations, uh, such as Compare. Uh, we did... Uh, uh, a combination with a Say Yes program. We do Say Yes uh, Academies as well, where we host uh, decorating classes for the youth. We also partner with uh, Deion Dawkins from the Buffalo Bills uh, for the Deion Dream Dreamers. Wow. So we do a lot of partnerships and giving back to our community. Yeah, and that's part of your mission, right? Talk to me about yes. what your mission is. So our bakery exists because mostly, not only do we want to create generational wealth within our family, but we also want to extend that to the people who live in Buffalo around us. Mm -hmm. um, we want to get back in any way possible, so the bakery exists as an avenue to do that, whether it be donations through our physical time, through just helping other people when it comes to financial literacy and things like that. We want to be able to spread that. So. So, so one of the things that we doing, um, we are partnering with the Mayor Summer Youth Program. We are starting a workforce program for the youth as well to learn fundamentals of baking, artistry baking. For my wife and other uh, artistry uh, uh, artists, bakers. Yeah. bakers within the community. So we will be partnering with the Mayor Summer Youth Program as well. Amazing. I, I'm getting hungry, so you've got to walk <laughs> me through what you brought for us today. These are absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. So I guess we'll go this way. Okay. Uh, we have the carrot cake here. 
Uh, next to that, we have a strawberry cake, which is ice cream theme. <laughs> then we have in the middle, it's a vanilla cake, but it's we have a new cake trend going That's around. That's so cute. You've seen it. It's the cartoon cake. Yeah. So we wanted to give that a try. It's vanilla flavored. Then next to that, we have our coconut cake, a little miniature version of it. <laughs> and then we have a Biscoff cake. This I don't know is if yummy. You've heard of the airplane cookies? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I always choose those. <laughs> right. And then we have chocolate chip cookies and our fudge brownies with M&Ms in the middle there. So yummy. What do you want people to feel when they come into your shop when you guys finally open? We want the impact of what we do to embody you when you're eating the baked goods because you doing that is a way of supporting the community, yes. right? So as you're eating this, you're also having it in your mind that we're donating part of that proceed to somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a two-in-one type of thing. We want you to be happy, give family vibes, kind of mm -hmm. like you do in Thank Grandma's you. Kitchen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so jealous of you guys. My sister is actually a phenomenal baker. She's visiting me this weekend, so I'm going to have to bring her over to you guys. You, you. We'll have to have a sneak peek. <laughs> and she can, you can teach her some of these things because this is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And I really want to know if you have any events coming up. Yes, yeah, so March 18th, we're going to have a big, giant event. Um, it's going to be live performances, it's going to be giveaways, um, it's going to be face painting, a DJ, live music. It's more of a, a community event than a grant opening for us. We want to uh, embrace Black Rock community. Wow, that is <laughs> awesome, and that's what we're doing today. Thank Obviously, you. right now we're celebrating Black History Month as it, you know, as it ends, and we know that it doesn't stop here, right? It's right. not just this month, Black History is all day, every day. Yes. Uh, but what does it mean to you guys? Um, for me, it's about connecting to roots, uh, learning history, just reflecting on the past, and just nominating and bringing forward the people of today that are. Yes. Ownership is key, um, especially what happened to um, Black Wall Street years ago. Mm -hmm. um, black people had a lot of land, we had a lot of businesses going on for each other, and we just want to bring that back to our community. Well, thank you guys. We wish you the best of luck with your opening and your party, and, and you. we know that you're going to do great things for this community, so thank you so much. <laughs> you. Still to come on Daytime Buffalo, a coffee shop with a mission. We're talking to the owners of Unapologetic Coffee. Stick with us. That's coming up after the break. Raul, you are the owner of Dirty Bird, which we know is a huge success. People love chicken and waffles, let me tell you. And uh, I've just, I've seen people coming up to your truck. What does it mean to you to be in business, especially as a black business owner, as we close out Black History Month? Uh, we just appreciate the, the support from the community that we get. Uh, community's been great since we started, you know, so it means, especially uh, being a black owned business, we get support from all different uh, various ethnic groups, so it, it really helps us out. Now you have the food trucks and you guys have been so successful that you've been able to open a restaurant, right? Yes, uh, we had the food trucks for the last eight years uh, and we've had the restaurant for three years now. Now during this Black History Month, it's a time of reflection. What does Black History Month mean to you? Uh, Black History Month to us in general, the crew and uh, all the staff, gives us a time to reflect on those that came before us who uh, made the sacrifices they did to give us the opportunity to do what we're able to do now. Talk to me a little bit about what's on the menu, especially when you have your food trucks. I know you guys are very big and popular during uh, the summertime, but even during the wintertime, you're holding people down, giving the people what they want. What's on the menu? Uh, our basics are chicken and waffles. Um, that, well, now for Lent, uh, we have fish fry. Um, various, uh, we have haddock fish fry, we have fish tacos, uh, chicken tacos, various different items, uh, you know, that are on our menu year round. but. Uh, that keep the crowds coming back. What do you think makes your chicken and waffle better or the best? Because so, you know, everyone can make a chicken and waffle, but people keep coming back to your place. You know, we make everything fresh off the truck and in the restaurant. Uh, nothing's ever frozen, so it, it, the quality and love that we put into uh, everything that we put out really uh, makes it stand out. How do you give back to the community? Because clearly they've been supportive of you. Throughout the year, we, we find various uh, organizations to donate back to. Uh, uh, I'm myself a mentor in Niagara Falls, uh, for the Niagara Falls High School. Uh, so any, anytime we give back to the community, we, we love to do it. What is next for you guys as you continue to go on your successful journey? 
Uh, we have a couple things uh, in, in the works, so maybe one more uh, food trailer is going to be hitting the road by a little bit before summertime, so hopefully that uh, can uh, be a good, good start. That'll be very exciting. Looking forward to the warm weather for some chicken and waffles. Thank you so much for coming on, doing great stuff, and giving everyone what they want to make them <laughs> no longer hungry. Thank you. A pilot program in Britain testing a four-day work week was so successful that 91% of the companies involved said they would make it permanent. Now, some U.S. lawmakers are pushing American companies to give it a try. One fewer day each week of the alarm clock and the morning commute. John Byrne says once his software company in Baltimore instituted a 32-hour work week, the productivity of his 37 employees increased. And so did profits. We've asked um, the employees to ruthlessly look at their work, get rid of extraneous meetings, extraneous phone calls, paperwork, um, things of this nature, and reduce down the amount of wasted work. The COVID stay-at-home orders gave millions of workers their first taste of flexible work arrangements, and some employers discovered less can be more. A CBS News review finds at least a half dozen states to varying degrees are now considering legislation to make four-day work weeks more common, including Maryland, where new legislation would offer companies that institute shorter work weeks a tax break. Maryland Delegate Vaughn Stewart is one of the bill's sponsors. We're thinking that with more hours of rest, workers are going to be able to function better. Employees in four-day-a-week studies have reported less stress and less burnout and better physical health. New legislation in New York, California, and in the U.S. Congress would require companies that work employees more than 32 hours a week to pay overtime. Similar proposals have failed in the past. California's Chamber of Commerce called it a job killer not suited for all employers. Even supporters of the four-day work week acknowledge it's not for everyone. Absolutely. We don't think this is something that every single industry and every single business can do. But that's what we want to study. Supporters of that Maryland legislation argue it should include a broad range of workers, white collars, blue collars, to include the entire spectrum of the workforce to make it more effective. We are blessed to have another guest in studio. We've got Alicia and Elisa of Unapologetic Coffee. Thank you guys so much for being Thank here. Thank you for having us. us. Um, did you guys feel that twin dump? <laughs> <laughs> I just felt we that. We don't do it on purpose. purpose. <laughs> oh, that was so cute. I want to know all about Unapologetic Coffee and how you got started. Um, so we got started quite organically. It was a family thing for us. We got started drinking coffee when we were young, at a young age with our grandma around a fireplace. So as we grew up and expanded across you know, all parts of the country. It's one of those things that we use as a communication tool. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, uh, my sister working at a school, she wanted to open a space that her kids could actually go to and have a safe space. But COVID kind of put a lot of blocks in the way for restaurants. So we decided to become a fully online coffee roaster. And that's that's how Unapologetic mm -hmm. Coffee got started. Yeah, the cafe, it's like the afterthought. Everyone's like, oh, you opened a cafe? I'm like, we actually opened a roaster. And then the cafe came like three, four months yeah. later. Yeah. Now, for those who don't mean, what do you mean by a roaster? So literally, like, everything we serve in our shop, we roast ourselves. We are 100% um, roasting, packaging, delivering all of our coffee ourselves wow. with our, like, three-man crew. <laughs> <laughs> you put in a lot of work. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, part of your mission is that you're 100% women-owned. Yes. yes. And obviously, we couldn't change that. We are just, you know, twin sisters who happen to love working together. Um, but we've been really fortunate. The, the girls who are at the shop, um, they just kind of came gradually, so we're still 100% women ran to this day. Even our mom. Even our mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really a full family business. True. Yeah. And what's next for you guys? How are you planning to expand? Uh, yeah, we're looking so. to definitely branch out nationally. Um, we've been getting a lot of traction regionally. Wow. Yeah. And we the recently... hope is. Yeah, we, we did a lot of things last year mm -hmm. that kind of set us up for a great year. Mm -hmm. um, we recently got funded through UB's Cultivator for a hundred thousand um, dollar equity investment. So it Congratulations. did help us get on the yeah. right path. Um, so I think. Like yeah, we're just doing a lot of little things. Like, we always want to be a part of our community. So a lot of the small things we're doing um, is just trying to be more community-based and focused as well. Like, just not forgetting where we come from. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I have to give you a shout-out because your website is phenomenal. Thank I think you. it's, it's all beautiful. It's all 
<laughs> it's, the layout is gorgeous. Oh, your you pictures so are awesome. <laughs> and so you, you push a lot of people to your website, huh? We do. Um, because we're predominantly online, when we're not open, the internet is open 24-7, mm -hmm. and that's how we market it. Um, and that being said, when the cafe is closed, when there's a storm, we always get the orders coming in, and there's always someone in the shop who can package and send the orders out every day. We have great communication with all of our shipping and distributors. Mm -hmm. And when you guys do expand, are you hoping that if it goes, you know, to other places, they will continue to try to be women run? Yeah, like, absolutely. I think there's something to be said about the power and, like, value that we put into it. Um, we always laugh because if we're not physically at the event, they're like, where are you guys? And, like, it's not on purpose. <laughs> you know, we just, you know, there's two of us, and our mom can only make two at a time. <laughs> 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 so hopefully, like, I mean, our goal is to really just try to reach everyone. And if we're not all women owned and ran, um, this, the goal is sort of reach women and reach people of color in the BIPOC community still. Absolutely. I want to know, uh, we're again celebrating Black History Month. I've been asking all of my guests, what does it mean to you? Um, I think for us, it means just celebrating our everyday history. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of get uh, sometimes pigeonholed into just one month, but we being African American, being black owned businesses, living in uh, predominantly black neighborhoods, um, you kind of just take ownership of who you are, take ownership of where you're coming from, and then also the legacy you leave behind for the next path behind you. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, especially, it's like black joy. You know, when do we talk about that? When do we talk about how great we're doing as a community, as a culture? And so for us, like, Black History Month is just one of those months that we highlight it, but for us, every single day is about black joy. I love that you guys mentioned that because so often we tend to think about some of the a lot of the trauma that mm -hmm. comes with us, yes. but this is a time to really celebrate the joyfulness and the, our accomplishments. Congrats and kudos Thank to both you. of you. You guys are killing it. We are Thanks so, so proud of you and we hope to see you continue to go far and succeed. Thank you. Keep that twin dump. We <laughs> love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now coming up next, the idea of starving artists no more. We take a look at a couple who's making waves in the art community. Keep it here. That's next. And making a passion into a career, that's what one Buffalo man did. And now he's sharing his story. We take a closer look at Chef Darian. That's coming up after the break. Well, our next guest is a fabulous couple that I had the honor of meeting over the weekend. Uh, we've got Idris and Alexa Wajed. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Now, you guys have Eat Off Art, and I really love that. Can you tell the viewers what the story is behind that? Do you want to start? So Eat Off Art basically is like the opposite of the narrative that is out there, has been out there for years. Like, you're going to be an artist, you're going to starve. Starving artist. And so just on a small road trip, Alexa and I was like, what's the opposite of that? Like, what, what, do, we, what do we want to want to say, like, you know, in our practice? It was like, we want to be able to feed ourselves. We want to be able to eat. And we have children. Like, we want to be able to survive, thrive. And so that's when Eat Off Art was born. And it was like, yeah, that that's... That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Now, viewers at home watching, you guys, this is kind of the face behind probably some of the art that I'm sure you guys have seen. You created the Lion Mural that is so yeah. famous here and yes. a, a bunch of other work talked to, and you were part of the Freedom Wall yes. that we talked mm -hmm. about. So talk to me a little bit about public art and public mural art and why you guys find the value of it. Well, I'll start with the value in terms of public art. And we're now in this um, time when art is seen as so healing and important. Mm -hmm. And people want it everywhere, right? But public art is important because, in our opinion, it allows artists to make money mm -hmm. and to have their artwork seen, but it also brings attention to the spaces that it's in, the, the awareness that is needed to fix the sidewalks or add lighting, make it more mobile, make it more walkable, make it more safe, especially in our communities that, that need that highlight. Absolutely. I mean, and for us, particularly, like we're talking about Black History Month, when we were growing up, we didn't see any black artists mm -hmm. practicing, right? So this allows, being public art allows it to be seen right. and accessible, and that automatically kind of inspires the next generation of a child that, can, that was there to witness that mural or even participate in the mural oftentimes, too. 
And you guys have really helped bring a lot to Buffalo, including Carol's daughter, which is huge. Yeah, <laughs> huge. Pretty yeah huge. that was a long time ago. We used to own a gallery on Elmwood Avenue, and we were the first to carry the line of Carol's daughter when actually Lisa owned it. She hasn't really owned it anymore. Yeah. But we were the first to carry it here in Buffalo. No one had heard about it, and no one understood what the products were about. Mm -hmm. And then we actually were scoped out by a few people, yeah. corporate people here once we were in our gallery. Yeah. Now, if you viewers don't know what the importance of that, Carol's Daughter is a huge uh, product line for ethnic hair, curly hair. They have amazing products that we love in our community, and it, it's a big deal. They're now everywhere. Everywhere. But, you know, I started my curly hair, my natural hair journey back in the day, the beginning of YouTube, when there was like five videos, right, right. and they always had Carol's Daughter. Yes. So for it to for you guys to bring it here to Buffalo was a really yeah. big deal that people don't give you enough credit for. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want to talk about your history and as a, as a couple and partnering and working together because that's a hard job and you Absolutely. guys have a lot of history. You've known each other since high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm great. I'm, I tell everybody, I'm really, really, really grateful for Alexa, you know, for so many reasons. But we started out as friends and, and staying as friends is like paramount yes. to our relationship, you know. Um, and it so, just so happens that we both have an interest in art. Uh, we're both creatives. We're both problem solvers in a sense. And so that's our language. You know, that's, 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 that's where we're most comfortable and suited. But, um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm super grateful. That's all I can say. I'm just grateful because this is very rare. It's yeah, very it rare. It really is. Because it's still you a marriage. Can find me some, find it's me. Still a marriage. And I just want to give Alexa a shout out right now because um, you also make jewelry. Yes. Yeah, we actually both make jewelry. I um, hand paint upcycled leather earrings and jewelry and accessories. Um, and I, I started just a few years ago, but these are some of them. Beautiful. Hand painted. Hand painted, yes, with my abstract art. And Idris is um, uh, metalsmith, second yeah, generation. Second generation. Wow. I don't do a jewelry as often as I want. However, it is there. Yes. It's like I have it as a skill set. I want to know what's next for you two. Ooh. Wow. Let's see, wow. what time is it? Oh. <laughs> and I want wow. an inside scoop. I know you've wow. always got stuff going. Because wow. the Freedom Mall, was, that, was a big, that was a big deal. Big you guys deal. work with the AKG. Yes, correct? yes, yeah. working with the AKG. Idris yeah. has a project coming up, a, a mural with um, an artist outside of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. um, collaborating with Albright Knox just as a community liaison. And then we're also putting a lot of our efforts to our nonprofit which is called Culture Inc. And we're working on artistic program, non-traditional and innovative artistic programming that deals with mental health. Beautiful. And we know the value that art can bring in helping mm. mental health and Absolutely. people in crisis and struggling. So Absolutely. You guys Absolutely. are doing so you guys are doing big things. I could talk to you guys <laughs> all you. day. Same, same. Let us know when you same. want a coffee. We appreciate your time here and, and I know that you guys have more incredible stuff coming up. We're looking out for you, looking Thank over you. all of the walls of Buffalo and seeing wow. your art and, and inspiring black people, uh, especially in our community, we don't always see black love that looks healthy that looks mm. strong that's a partnership so thank yeah. you guys for being a great example thank and you. the work you're doing in the community mm, thank you for the impact you're having yes thank definitely. you <laughs> <laughs> all right coming up james corden is preparing a star-studded send-off from cbs's late late show and the academy award ceremony is less than two weeks away bradley blackburn has more on your eye on entertainment Write a lot of jokes and try to fit into your tuxedo. That's how Jimmy Kimmel says he's preparing to host the Oscars next month. I think you just want to be ready for anything. And you never obviously don't know when something crazy might happen. And crazy things seem to be happening a lot lately. Kimmel last hosted the award show in 2018 and in 2017 when the wrong Best Picture winner was announced. Last year's ceremony was infamously interrupted when Will Smith slapped presenter Chris Rock. NCIS airs its 450th episode tonight on CBS. Vega wasn't alone. Why aren't we looking at two fatalities? This could be why. It was used to uh, weigh down on the gas pedal. The team investigates the death of a rideshare driver found dead after a car accident. NCIS debuted nearly 20 years ago, and actor Brian Dietzen, who plays Dr. Jimmy Palmer, has been there for all of it.
how these characters interact with one another and live their lives and how we see how the cases affect them personally has been kind of a hallmark of our television show. And I think that's what's kept us going. Welcome to the Late Late Show. And James Corden is preparing to sign off from the Late Late Show in a big, big way. CBS is giving him a one-hour primetime special ahead of his final broadcast on April 27th. It will include a Lion King musical performance featuring actor Tom Cruise, from the looks of it, playing the warthog Pumbaa. More stars are expected to join in on the fun. So to come, turning a passion into a career. We continue to celebrate Black History Month with a look at Chef Darian. Keep it here. That's coming up after the break. Well, as we continue to honor Black History Month, we meet a man whose love of cooking has turned into a delicious career. News 4 Sarah Minkowitz takes us into the kitchen with Chef Darian Bryan. You gotta find something that you love and focus on. That's why cooking is my thing. I'm making people happy through food. Chef Darian Bryan always knew he belonged in the kitchen. I was like 12 years old helping my mom in the kitchen. I'm like, I love this. I love the way food makes people happy. You know, food is love. Food brings people together. Brian grew up in Jamaica with a large family, and they always gathered around the dinner table. It's like 23 of us in one home, and that's, that's the one thing that brings us together, food. So I'm like, I want to be a chef because I'm always going to have a job because people got to eat, right? And people love good food. About 10 years ago, he moved from Jamaica to Buffalo and immediately got to work carving out his path. Work at Denny's, my very first job in America. Denny's teach me so much. I've never seen pancake before, never seen bacon, no moon to go Miami. We don't have that stuff in Jamaica where I'm from in the country. He went to culinary school at ECC, then studied management at Buffalo State University. In the years that followed, he cooked at places like Hutch's Restaurant and Prima Cafe in Hamburg. It was there that he met his first Buffalo Bills player, Vontae Davis. I never watched football a day in my life. I, I'm from Jamaica, we play soccer, right? So I don't know, know anything about football. So when this guy asked me to be his personal chef, I'm like, this guy, I told my wife, I'm like, this guy wants me to be his personal chef. He said, play, play for the Buffalo Bills. I'm like, she's like, that's a big deal. Before he knew it, more NFL players wanted a taste of his authentic dishes. The word of mouth, people heard about me, the Jamaican guy cooking all this delicious food. They're like, they want a piece of it too. And I pretty much cook for the entire team overall, like, you know, Josh, Diggs, name them, I cook for them. Brian says it was when he opened his venue, the Plating Society on Seneca Street a year ago, that he felt he made it. Yeah, when I opened this place, I'm like, wow, after doing our, you know, all these dinner parties, going to people's home, and I have to, like, have my own space, it's like, yo, I really, I did this, you know what I mean? I'm like, it's like my second home, I never want to leave this space. But he does, to spend time with his wife, Jessica, who he credits a lot of his success to, and their children. I got a great team and great you know, support each and every day, so I'm just grateful, I'm just blessed, man. I'm just happy to be here. 10 years and still going strong, baby. <laughs> Sarah Minkowitz, News 4. We would like to thank every single one of our guests on today. We had Rada Baked Goods, we had Brown Bag, um, uh, minority Business Directory, we just had uh, Eat Off of Art, um, and we had our unapologetic coffee. So thank you all of our guests that came on. Now it's time for our pop culture quiz. Our production supervisor, James, will be asking me questions, and you, the viewers, can play along. You can yell out on your screen, or you can tweet me your answers. All right, James? Are right, you ready? Yes. You've been doing pretty good at these, so Okay. Well. <laughs> maybe a couple hard ones here. Oh, goodness. Um, what is the name of Michelle Obama's debut memoir? Becoming. Okay, hard one, like I told you. <laughs> Which song passed Ed Sheeran's Shape of You as the most streamed song on Spotify? I didn't even know Shape of You was the For most long time. streamed song. I don't know. Mariah Carey? <laughs> All I want for Christmas is um, you. <laughs> the Weeknd? The Weeknd, really? You know, you know what song it would be? We'll give you half of it. Okay. It was the weekend was the half. Oh, um, then I don't know. Blinding light. Blinding light? Yeah. Most Really? Yeah. Most street like billions. Would you guys would have guessed that? I would not have guessed that. Wow. People like it. People like him. Okay. No, no, the music one. So here's here's your Whitney. Whitney Houston famously covered I Will Always Love You. 
Who sang the original? Is that the Dolly Parton one? That is the Dolly Parton Yay! one. Yay! Go Dolly! And she famously gave the song to Whitney. Yes, we know that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now Did that... you know, by the way, Dolly Parton apparently has an album that she's she's has she's it's done and she's saving it till after she passes away to be released isn't that crazy i listen we appreciate dolly around here like i like dolly so. i love dolly she's like a national treasure oh, who doesn't yeah. love dolly crazy people <laughs> <laughs> all right next question which duo won the first grammy for best rap performance oof can i have a hint uh, yeah, it uh, eventually led to a 90s TV show where one young man's life got turned, flipped, turned upside down. Oh, um, okay, well, I know obviously one is Will Smith, but what was his duo? Uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff. Oh. And the Fresh Prince. The Fresh Prince, mm -hmm. who knew? Okay. And the last hard one for today, um, which actor famously starred as Black Panther in Marvel's Black Panther? Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick Boseman. Rest in peace. We all love him. All right. Good did you question. See the, did you see the second? Yes, like I did. How was that? I, I haven't cried. seen it yet. I cried. Oh. Well, Daytime Buffalo, we'll be right back. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back tomorrow at 3 right here on Channel 4. We'll see you then.